Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. We've got another amazing guest for today's show. Today's guest is experienced and passionate change leader with a demonstrated history of working in the transportation industry and even comes from a family of railroaders. She's currently the organizational change practitioner at Norfolk Southern Corporation. Please welcome to the show, Sydney Henry. Hello, Sydney. Hi, Justin. Thank you. Really excited to have you here today. And I want to start off the show as we always do and ask you what you think is the biggest challenge facing the frontline deskless workforce today. Absolutely. Talk about this topic all the time. Not a hard answer at all. Absolutely communicating with them is the biggest challenge. Um, but why is kind of what I want to talk about. I see, and I've, I've been a, a victim of the same thing, to communicate in the very beginning with the frontline workers to get their opinion about something, but not following up enough throughout the process. So that constant communication is what I'll be more specific to say. I think um, that initial maybe test in, in the field or on the front line testing the technology or the process change is very important, but even especially using an agile methodology, that constant communication of, hey, did something new come up? Or is there some special circumstance we can talk about that you didn't talk about before? I absolutely think that communication is, is key and in person is better. So in the time of COVID, that's really hard to do. Yeah. So you've mentioned a few things there that um, I really love your point about not letting the communication be just a one and done activity. And especially as I hear you describing it, you didn't say these words, but I feel like what you're saying is don't let it just, just be a box checking exercise to say, hey, we communicated with them, you know, six months ago, we've, we've, uh, you know, accomplished what we needed to do there. Talk through that a little bit more. Have you, are there any examples of insights that you've gleaned or why, why do you think it's so important to, to make it more of a repetition? Yeah, keeping them in the loop, um, just because things will come up as days go on. I think every day I work my job, I learn something new about it, right? Mm -hmm. So that initial day that you have a conversation and you're in certain circumstances and you think about it, okay. And even if for projects a year long, think about that, the season's changing, the weather's changing, what you're experiencing is changing. I think we had a, we talked about this uh, before, what you're doing in technology, maybe you're on an iPad, an iPhone, and in the summer, you're not wearing gloves, but in the winter you are. Right. So just little things like that, that special circumstances that might come up as the project continues, as the seasons change, um, as there's turnover. So once you have a new manager or something that you can see that's not going to be consistent, it, it kind of depends on the management. It depends on the location, who you're around, just any little thing that can change that it can all come up in one conversation. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's understandable. And that's a, a really good way to think about it. We we think about. Um, you know, managing technology change as really not just a one and done thing, but as a life cycle that, and, and so I love the way that you've thought about that in such an iterative fashion and even talking about some of the, just the physical factors of, of yes. asking questions, different times of the year, you know, you and I did talk, touch on this a little bit uh, during our prep call where we, we talked about just, you know, the men and women on the front lines, sometimes of the year are wearing gloves. Sometimes they're using different tools or interacting with different vehicles and, and equipment and things like that. And so it, it makes a difference to really get feedback at, you know, all points along that journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like I said, in person is awesome to communicate in person and to do, you know, a walk along or to really a day in the life that makes all the difference. And that natural communication, as you're just walking through the job, the things that come up, are, it's, you can't, you can't do that same thing over the phone or yeah. on a team's meeting or something. 
Yeah, no, I think you're spot on. Well, let's let's go back and give the audience a, a little bit of uh, background on on you. I, I really enjoyed our conversation in the prep call, and I think our audience is going to really uh, find your background fascinating. So I went ahead and included it right in the introduction to say that you came from a family of railroaders. So that's going to kind of force us here to go back all the way to, uh, to your family and, and explain how you even got involved in the railroad business in the first place. Absolutely. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about the railroad in general. And I didn't stop and actually think, you know, just growing up, just in adulthood, where everything's coming from that we're getting. And the railroad has a lot to do with that. And so I'm very proud to be a part of supplying everyone with their needs and wants. So that that's awesome. It, it gives me a sense of joy and pride to work um, in that industry. And I have family members who also feel that same pride. And we are railroaders, quote unquote. That is a term that we like to use to uh, identify ourselves. Railroad. I, I love it. Yeah, it's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I stumbled, stumbled across OCM. Um, I was already working with the railroad and I just stumbled across this gym, this practice and job title. I had no idea it existed and it just kept coming up. Hey, Sydney, do you, do you know about OCM? Are you the OCM resource? Have you thought about this? And I'm, I have no idea. So I just started doing some research and a couple months went by as I'm just gathering notes and, and trying to figure out what more I need to do to dive into this practice. And an opportunity came around and I, I joined the OCM practice and never looked back. So what kind of background did you have to have from an education standpoint and earlier in your career before you got into OCM? I, I imagine you didn't just get dropped into that role. What was Not your path that led you there? So I graduated with a bachelor's in logistics and intermodal transportation. And I like to think of logistics as problem solving. Uh, how do you get to the end, uh, the best way to get to that end point? And I believe OCM ties into that in every possible way. And there's a lot of things to consider and you don't want to overlook any one part of that supply chain or you, you want to consider everything that could go wrong, right, the risks, the impact at every stage. And OCM is absolutely that. But uh, problem solving is my passion. Logistics is my passion. So you get the transportation company, get the railroad. Yeah. That's how I got there. Yeah. And then uh, I, I'm, I'm a people person. I would like to say that I describe myself as a people person. There's almost nobody I can't get along with and it just kind of fit. And I, I had an amazing mentor at the very beginning who was still my mentor to teach me everything with over 20 years experience. I, I was drinking from a water hose for about five months and just got that one-on-one -on -one training in OCM that is priceless. And when you started off at the railroad though, you started off as an analyst, if I remember correctly. Absolutely. Yes. So, so how did you go from being an analyst into being a, a change leader? I asked. Okay. So I, tell us more I about that. Change. I asked for change. <laughs> um, just as I was growing in, in, in the company and making friends, I started really feeling out what, where I wanted to go in my career and what kinds of things I wanted to be doing every day. And that was absolutely engaging with people. That's what I wanted. I wanted more face-to-face -face time. I wanted more opportunity to meet new people. And I just asked management, senior management and leaders said, hey, there's some things I want to change. And I had that support to move to OCM where everyone agreed would be a good fit for me. And to this day, I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, sometimes we just got to uh, ask for what we want in our careers. And it sounds like you were very assertive in, in doing that. So, uh, and, and you're also being rewarded by being able to pursue that opportunity. And uh, it sounds like it's just a great fit for you and your personality. So that's, that's awesome. It is. Well, let's, let's go back to what we talked about in the beginning when we talked about um, the, the biggest challenge that, you know, you see facing frontline workers, you talk specifically about communicating and, and making sure that we keep that communication very iterative. If we were to flip that around a little bit, and if we had a room full of, of the frontline workers that you support in your organization, and we asked them what they think their biggest challenge was, do you think they would say the same thing, or do you think they'd have a different perspective on that? Good question. Great question. Yes. I think they would say the same thing. Communicating with them is, is I'll say it's not hard, right? And I, I bet a lot of um, OCA practic practitioners would say the same thing. 
it's not hard, but it is, I mean, when you're working on a project every single day and you're making updates and changes to the technology every single day, it can be hard to keep the end user updated and in the loop, like I said, every step of the way. So I would believe they would, they would honestly say that too. Like, you know, if probably if they could have the opportunity to sit in those meetings every day, they would appreciate that. Um, and that's just not possible on every project, as we all know. You know, we had another guest, Doug Icorn from um, Whole Foods. And he said something that um, what you're saying is reminding me of something that he also said, which is that we look at agile development as, you know, all good because it's, it allows us to release software faster and uh, it's more efficient from a development standpoint, but that there are people on the receiving end of that increased pace and the iteration. And sometimes we need to slow that pace down a little bit. So just because it's good for development and just because it's good for the effectiveness and efficiency of those teams doesn't necessarily mean that we need to subject the people on the receiving end to that of, of that to all of that change. And I, I feel like you're saying that that they're they're on the receiving end of that and making sure that we're communicating what's coming down the pipe and and why Absolutely. is really important. Absolutely. And sometimes there there are parts of the job that cannot stop because of a, a change to technology or to a process. And so how you allow for a backup to something you're just introducing very quickly in an agile style, um, that's very important. So making sure there's always a, a backup plan for this very fast pace change um, so that operations don't stop. That's important as well. Yeah. So what do you do to make sure that you understand how things really work out in the field? I go to the field. Absolutely. All right. So, so tell us more about that. You're, yes. you're another field tripper. Yes. So, uh, yes. all right. So, so tell us more about it. Yes. Um, yeah, I actually have a couple interesting stories about the field. Let's see. So I like to get out there and do the walk alongs. Like I said, definitely show me exactly what specifically what we're going to change or what maybe what technology we're introducing, how it affects what you're about to do. I want to see with my own eyes. Don't tell me, just, just show me and take my own notes. And then if I have a question, I'll ask the question. Um, but sometimes just saying, what do you do? Misses so many of those little little steps. And um, it, it can be really important and it makes a huge impact. Are you saying when you ask potentially a user out in the field, hey, tell me about a day in your life. Yes. You're saying that they, even when they answer that, even if you're talking to those people themselves, yes. that they would skip over some things that are important. Is that, am I understanding your... Absolutely. Okay. Not even on purpose. I mean, you, right. do your, you do your job every day. It's like, you know, it's like the back of your hand, yeah. you're like do this, 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 and this, but, but what about that little tiny thing you did right there that this application we're developing needs its own button. It needs a drop down. It needs this. I mean, you would be missing that whole step. If I didn't see you can catch more things that way. And um, even taking pictures of that process or even video and showing developers the developers have to know exact, oh, and we, I've, I've heard it many times, oh, that's what the, you know, if you have developers overseas or anything, it's great to bring everyone in the loop and get everyone on the same page with that same visual. And now we're working together. Now we're making things happen. So. That's fantastic. Yeah. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, it, it sounds like this level of involvement is happening actually maybe before some of the technology has been developed. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. In many instances, oh, we've got all kinds of frontline workers of different areas doing different jobs. And when we can, absolutely, before the technology is, I would think that's the best practice to observe the work before there's any development. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned um, in our first conversation is that you actually have a UX professional on... Yeah on your OCM team. Tell us a little bit more about, I was fascinated by that. And, and maybe this is a common practice, but I'm pretty sure this is the first time I'd heard of this um, on your team. So tell us more about that. Absolutely. Um, and shout out to her. I hope she sees this. <laughs> yes, me too. But we, we love to, to publicize that to the company that, and, and we're still, you know, always selling OCM, the benefits of OCM, why we're here, you know, we're not just jumping on, 
IT knows technology, right? Business knows processes and OCM knows people. And if those three things aren't aligning, then we've got problems, but we're here to show you why people should be at the top of that list. The people that are, are hitting, getting that impact, right? And uh, what also helps get the people to the top of the list is having that UX person to even boost OCM even further. Not only can we help you with all of these OCM deliverables and um, this methodology, but we also have the UX person working in tandem with us to, to develop all of the, anything that's gonna impact that end user. So uh, just for example, it was a trip that I, I just took a field test actually to test an application on an iPhone. And we're looking at the application and we couldn't see it very well because it was so bright outside. Yep. <laughs> but everyone that tests the, the application is usually in a building or at home, right? So it's that, and it's easy to call the UX person on our team and say, hey, what's the best practice for you know the colors on a phone or an iPad or a tablet outside? And it's, it's quick. You know, and and to even sit together, OCM and UX, in some of the project meetings, it's like, hey, the user wants this, and then OCM can say, and the user needs this, and this is how we get both of them. So it's awesome. That's fascinating. Well, kudos to to your team uh, and and the leadership in your organization for for making that investment. It's great that you know your team, your company has invested in in that expertise to have a specialist on the team that you know really understands the the human and technology integration um, because that is such a key element of successful you know change management and adoption of that technology in the long run and so to put that on the OCM team where you're actually studying um, and, and trying to you know soften the blow of, of that change is yeah. uh, is really a fascinating move mm -hmm. yep um, we're loving it yeah that's very good so let's think about I, I'd like to touch on, the pandemic, we we've brought the pandemic up on a lot of the shows and, you know, there are some industries that have been more affected than others. Obviously all of us have been affected by the pandemic, but I'm really curious to, to get your take on how the pandemic has affected, you know, the frontline workers in your organization. I know that you haven't stopped rolling trains, right? So, um, you know, so, but I also can imagine that many of the women, men and women in the, the um, knowledge worker space probably were working from home. And so I'm, I'm curious to, to hear just how that has affected things in your world over the last, you know, year and a half and, and specifically the impact that it may have had on your frontline workers. Absolutely. I will say for me specifically, the biggest impact it's that not being able to get out there as much, yeah. um, just from a safety perspective. You, if you can do it from home, absolutely do it. And there have been more instances where it made more sense to stay home and try to talk with frontline workers or um, product owners, things like that, instead of actually going out in the field. So uh, that, that would probably be my biggest impact for them. Again, just safety and health. Um, like you said, we got to roll the trains, right? And a lot of other organizations can't stop. And so just the safety and health perspective of it and, and ensuring that that's the number one priority, you know, yeah. no matter what. Hearing you say that you've been held back from going out into the field. I, I mean, just seeing your body language as you described that and having gotten to know you just now for a, a little bit in our prep call and, and then today, I feel like you must have felt like you were handcuffed to your desk, you know, in, in not being able to do your job fully. Did you find ways that you could bridge the gap so that you could still try to communicate with the men and women that you would normally be communicating with and, and just find either tools or approaches that, that tried to make up for the, the physical divide? Absolutely. And um, I'll, I'll say product owners, and project team members that have done that job before that are now maybe knowledge workers, great resource um, to rely on and depend on. And if, if you've been in those shoes before and I can't go or maybe can't communicate or can't access that person at a specific time, that is a wonderful resource to have. And 
it's something I've learned and a best practice for me to identify that person or a couple people on every project that have been in those shoes, have walked a mile, and can be a quick uh, chat or email away. Sometimes when frontline workers are, you know, peak season or just one of those days. So yeah, I would say nice. that was a workaround. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, when you're thinking about you know, beginning to implement new technology in your organization, is there a, a framework that you and your team follow to help guide that process? Uh, are you asking if we follow the ADCAR methodology? I, I am or any other methodology that, that you might be using instead. Yes. So um, we absolutely implement ADCAR and um, We've kind of designed our own methodology. Like I said, my, my manager now set up the practice and it's only a couple years in and growing all the time. And we, we always have meetings, meeting of the minds where we just talk about, hey, what does this company need from us? And so we're never going to you know, put handcuffs on ourselves and say, we can only do it this way. But every project's different. And you know, sometimes you have frontline workers, sometimes it's for knowledge workers. So we, we're definitely flexible, but all together, we, we want to turn awareness into knowledge and knowledge into ownership. How can we do that? And, and we start there. So you, you actually kind of created a good segue into the next question, which is really thinking about the similarities and probably more the differences between your traditional corporate team members versus your frontline workers. So when you're thinking about building awareness and, and kind of going through that process that you were just describing. Do you have different tactics that you use for how you communicate with the frontline workers versus how you uh, may communicate with your peers in the corporate office? Absolutely. So the frontline is a little more fast paced. Um, in my opinion, what I've seen just in my experiences, I see uh, the pace is a little bit more gets quicker. And so I think they're using word of mouth and stand up and, you know, just having conversation before shift changes as a way of communicating primarily is what I've seen. Knowledge workers, we're on the computer all day. So email and chat, it's a great way to communicate with us. We're going to, you know, we're going to see it either today or tomorrow. And um, so kind of figuring out that change champion network uh, and usually it's going to be a supervisors, managers, things like that. Communicating with them directly and even more often to use those shift changes. Guys, could, you can get a different message out three or four times if you, you know, if you have it set up that way um, at the beginning of the shift and the end of the shift and, and whatever it is, um, even postage signs up on the bulletin board in the lunch break room or um, on the front door as you walk into where your lockers are, or if you if you have frontline workers who use a truck to travel in that location, putting a little sign on the dash. So there are so many creative ways to communicate with frontline workers versus knowledge worker. Probably going to get an email. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you just talked about for the frontline uh, folks. You talked about mostly kind of traditional uh, forms of media, putting things up on bulletin boards and in the truck and stuff like that. Are you using any technology tools? I know probably traditional email like we might use for a corporate worker might not make sense, but are there any other uh, digital tools that you might be using? Are you leveraging Microsoft Teams or, or other tools like that to help facilitate that communication? Absolutely. We leverage Teams. Um, we have an internal, what I like to call our internal Facebook and so anyone that has access to that, it's a great way to, to spread the word, you know, updates, news, company-wide. Um, but there are also separate little channels for a, a specific group of people. So absolutely. Is, are you actually using Facebook for business or you use, yeah. or that's just I how you refer to it. You just, okay. Yeah. So you're just thinking of it as kind of a social platform. It and is, yeah. Do you mind sharing what tech platform you guys are using for that? I do mind. We have a face on the front of it, the okay. back end. Can't even tell you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we're curious to to really understand what uh, tools different companies are using to help facilitate this because there's, you know, we haven't gone back and looked at the statistics yet. Um, yeah. We're actually going to do this in the first part of this year, but we do ask the same question at the beginning of every podcast for a reason. Yeah. 
And, and that is in part to help frame the conversation that we're about to have, but it's also to start to kind of gather some very informal research to say, when we look at all these different companies and all these different industries with um, different types of frontline workers, but you know, following a very similar profile, what are the common challenges? And as I said, I haven't looked at the actual data yet, but I would guess that roughly greater than 50% of the yeah. respondents have told us that communication is, is the biggest challenge facing the, the frontline workforce. So knowing that, I want to start learning more. Well, what are we doing to help close the gap in communication? So being aware of it, just like we would say from the ad car standpoint, right? Be, having awareness that that's the problem is great. But what are we doing to actually solve that and fill in those gaps? And I think we still, I'm starting to hear some evidence that companies are starting to put some tools in place to bridge that gap. I think things like Teams are, are one of those potential solutions. Um, but it sounds like we still have a long way to go. If, um, you know, because th these men and women are engaged in social media, right? Facebook has whatever, two or 3 billion, you know, users around the globe. So it's not like these users aren't using their own mobile devices right. for other forms right. of communication and that they're incapable of reading those messages, but we're precluded from using some of those consumer tools for the purposes of the enterprise. So how are we going to close that gap? And, and I'm curious to see how that evolves in the, in the coming years. I will see if I can get back to you about what that back end is. I don't want to give you a front facing yeah. name that means nothing. Let me see if I can get what the back end and who maybe developed it. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I'd be, be curious to, to share that uh, with the audience because I, I think a lot of our listeners are trying to solve very similar problems and they have, you know, while they may not be in the railroad, um, they have, you know, very similar workforce and similar communication gaps. And so uh, the more that we could be sharing that on the podcast, I think it starts giving everybody some direction on, on how we might be able to fill some of those gaps. Absolutely. And you, you made a, a comment that I, I want to touch on quickly about how we have this perception that we all have iPhones, right? Or mm -hmm. smartphones or yep. some kind of technology that we're using. And it's actually my experience. You, you come across some people who don't mm -hmm. have that. And that can be challenging. You really have to develop when you think about training specifically, I would think how you're going to train the person who has this device already and just needs to know how to use the application versus the person that has never used this at all. Yeah. And how do you kind of bridge the gap between the two? We know that's a sweet spot for me because the business that we lead during the day um, when we're not podcasting is, is solving that exact problem. And so that's, that's very near and dear to us in that, you know, we recognize that we are working with enterprise employees that come from all walks of life and have all sorts of different technology in their life. Some of them love it. Some of them can't stand it. Uh, but either way, they need to use it to do their job. And so we're constantly thinking about what are the things that we can be doing and what are the practices? And, and of course, we're a technology companies. So we're thinking, you know, what are the technology tools that we can be using to help make that process easier for them, regardless of what their starting point is? And, um, so yeah, we, we obviously, uh, we certainly agree with your perspective on that. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk about, um, some of the, the, we've, we've talked a little bit about the best practices. And I think one of the greatest things that, that you've talked about is just, you know, getting out in the field and, and being a, a firsthand observer of what's going on in the field. So that as you're thinking about implementing change, um, you, you can take that real world experience back to the conference rooms and really think through that strategy. I'd be curious without putting you too much on the spot. Are there any things that you've tried to do from a, a change of leadership perspective that maybe didn't work the way that you expected, or at least came out with some lessons learned of things that you would do differently the next time? Yeah. So I'll say the first couple of times that I went out, I would set up a, a room and just start asking questions, get everybody in the room, we've got some developers, we've got the product owner, maybe manager of the new, of the product, uh, myself, and anyone else that would, would be, that could join at that time in person. And let's just all talk about it. Let's write down some things. Let's map out the as is, the to be, let's, let's start a start, stop, continue chart. Let's do whatever we can do right now here together. That can be a little intimidating. I think I would be a little intimidated as well to say, hey, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want to do right. that as X. And so I have actually asked everyone but the end users to leave the room. Can everyone just leave? <laughs> you know, nothing against you. Um, but when I introduce myself as the organizational change management practitioner, I'm here for you. 
I'm here for the people who are going to be affected by this change. So what scares you? What gives you heartburn? What makes you just not want to come to work tomorrow? Tell me, um, because that's why I'm here. It's not, you know, I'm not as tied to this as the person developing it. I'm tied to you and your experience with, with what they're developing. And so just asking that simple question, hey, can we just get the room? And that has opened up so many more comments and concerns that I can jot down and take back. But I would say one thing that hasn't worked was sometimes getting everyone in the same room hasn't always been the best strategy. That's such a, an amazing point. And I'm so glad that you've raised it. And, and you're just continuing to reiterate that a huge part of the role of, of a change leader is to deal with the human elements of this, right? And it's, it's not to suggest that the development team and the business analyst and everybody else didn't care about the humans, but they are definitely more focused on the design and the development and the architecture of the solution. And um, they, they have a different way of speaking, right? <laughs> so to be able to bring your empathy and just, you know, your caring approach to the table and really probably push all those other people out, I, I can see that having a really big impact. Yes. And, and they love it. The, the people on the project team love it. It's no one feels any kind of way about that because we realize what the end goal is. We all have the same one, right? So, so. you didn't get any pushback from, from the analyst or, or the dev team that might've been participating in that? No. That's Everybody good. on board. I mean, the best way you can get them to give the feedback, get it. Cause that's, we all want that. We really, and that's what I do love about, about my position is that when you can get on the team and, and show everybody the value of OCM and we all understand it, then there's much less pushback than if you don't start that yeah. way. Well, I think that really says a lot about the relationship that you have with your colleagues across those other functional groups. And it probably says even more about the culture that your organization has overall. And you should all be commended for that. Um, the fact that everybody can get focused on the job at hand and not let their egos um, or maybe some of the politics get in the way of doing what's right to really understand the needs of, of the frontline workers and then be able to take that feedback and go do something meaningful with it. That's, that's actually pretty powerful. I think it says a lot about your organization. Absolutely. And my, my mentor and many of my teammates have 20 plus, 15 plus years experience. And so I think it, it says a lot about I would say a lot of companies that OCM has been, is being brought on the way it is. And um, according to them, it's very different and much larger of a practice than it ever has been and continuing to grow. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. And we're really starting to put people first instead of the process or instead of the technology. So, right. yeah. You mentioned earlier, you feel like you um, as OCM practitioners still need to um, evangelize for the need and the benefits of change management. Why do you think that is? That's a great question. I'll have to chew on this one. We shouldn't have to fight this hard, huh? No. <laughs> We shouldn't. It, it um, honestly, I, I'll admit, you know, I, I've been a long time, like my career has been spent. I would consider myself more of a technologist, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Then certainly not uh, officially a change management practitioner, but I've been involved in significant change in all the companies that I've, you know, worked alongside. And so when I've heard some of the stories from other change practitioners, I'm like, this is the most obvious thing in the world. Why haven't we been doing this longer and, and more completely? And I, I don't really have a good answer to that, but it does strike me as odd that many of you that are really focused on this role do feel that you're still having to evangelize for the need for it. And, um, you know, maybe this is just part of the evolution of, you know, the, the global corporate environment that we're starting to recognize that with all this technology and all the other change, it just needs to be more proactive. But I think there is still a, a need to evangelize it a little bit. And I think... I think it's easy to, once you have your skill set, whether it be you know, developing or, or UX or any other kind of you know, skill, it's, it's easy to forget how hard it was for you to get to the level you are. So when you're developing something for someone else who is not an expert in this and that, you really need someone to constantly remind you, hey, this is for someone that's your day, where you were day one, right? They have to learn from beginning to end. And how can we make it as user-friendly and 
train on it the best and communicate it the best as we can. And so I would say maybe that's why we have to, to push as hard as we do. Yeah. I think it's really hard. I, I feel, um, the team of professionals that I'm fortunate to be surrounded by, we're all very sensitive to the needs of, of the human, um, you know, involved in, in all of what we do, but it's impossible to not build up biases over time and you need to, to reset that. Or, or maybe I guess I'm thinking of more assumptions, right? Assumptions that are created because we've had a handful of experiences. And so you start to think that those are representative of all people that you'll affect in the future. And you need to constantly remind yourselves that you need to go back and, and ask more questions and get more input because those assumptions will probably break down very shortly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You've touched on training a few times. Um, I know the training is a big part of, of successful, you know, change uh, management. What's your take on any, um, you know, best practices you found around training this unique worker profile under the unique circumstances that they have? Yes. So uh, we like to focus on, and I like to focus on adult, adult learning styles as much as possible. And so just saying, hey, we're going to train this way because it's the easiest or most cost effective or the most available is not the best way. Kind of surveying each of your stakeholder groups. How do you learn the best? And if you need to roll all of that into one training, that's fine. If you can break it down and provide all of it, that's even better. So for instance, having boots on the ground training, you really have a classroom setting um, where you also distribute handhelds and hard copies of what you're talking about and what you're showing. And then you kind of go on the job and you continue to train through that material on the job. So if you can do all of that, I would say that's a best practice. You can't always do that, but I have seen it done and it's extremely effective. And I love to be a part of the projects where we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> and when we can't, it just, it adds that level of challenge, but that's also, it's great to be able to solve the problem. Okay. We can't, we can't do a uh, boots on the ground training. What, how can we supplement that? And so even a training video that you can send and project on the wall in whatever situation you're in, I mean, that can help as well, just to see the face. Yeah. It goes back to looking at some of the technology tools that can be used to facilitate yeah. that. Yes. Absolutely. To, to, to close the gap. Yeah. Tell me, um, what is the, the contribution that you've made in your role that you are most proud about? I would say capturing the image, the image of whatever user we're affecting or impacting, like being able to provide the visual to go with the process, I would say doing that on as many projects as, as I can, that's where I get the, the most, I have the most impact is actually being the person to go and to talk and to record and share the visual of that person, kind of putting a face to a name kind of thing. You have an unusually high level of empathy <laughs> for those men and women, which I think ties in with what you just said about, you know, the, the pride that you've taken in being able to do that. Where, where does that strong empathy come from in your life? Well, how did, how did you develop that? Is that something that you've done consciously or is that just the result of maybe growing up in a family of some other railroaders, as you talked about earlier? I would say that um, I, I really probably have to give the credit to my mother, who is an educator. Yeah. And has a very strong passion for children and education. And, oh, she's, she's amazing. And I think that's where the empathy would come from. Yeah. It's, it, it's something that I think is um, unusually high uh, among all of the, the change practitioners yeah. that I've had the good fortune to speak with, especially on this, this podcast series. Yeah. And, um, you know, we haven't done any, uh, formal, you know, psychological backgrounds on, on any of the guests, but my, my informal, uh, questions have led to the discovery that, um, you know, your, your profile, uh, change practitioners have unusually high empathy. And it seems like there's always a story where, you know, somebody's got some background or, or something that connects them to the men and women that they serve on the front lines that has made them so perfectly suited to the role. And, and you definitely are an example of that. 
And like I said, I, I stumbled on it. I didn't even see it in myself. I hadn't identified it in myself, but the people around me were, were helping me to identify that. And I'm still grateful to this day that they were able to put a job title with just who I was naturally. And I was able to marry the two. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's what's so neat and why I continue to be so fascinated by this role and the people that fill it in that, you know, few people I've heard have, you know, entered into university and said, Hey, we're, I'm going to go take the necessary classes to become a change management practitioner. But there's something about that combination of the education that they had and that background that was either connected to their family or an early job that they had that makes them again, you know, just, uh, kind of off the charts in terms of their empathy for, for those, uh, men and women. And so it just, it, it makes sense that you would be very attracted to that. And the people, the other professionals around you would see that you had those, those natural qualities that would draw you into that. Yes. Yes. And some of them did have a background in OCM themselves. And so they were able to identify what kind of skills and, and what personality type kind of really fits with that. And yeah, like I said, grateful, grateful to yeah. them for it in me. Yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, it sounds like it's a great match for them and for you. And so, uh, I'm sure you're going to continue to uh, develop as a professional there and, um, you know, continue to further your skills. That's really awesome. Absolutely. So what, what do you love most about working around technology? Love about technology specifically. Yeah. Okay. It's your answer. So you get to give it to me however you want. <laughs> so what I've seen technology can be used to solve a problem or it can just be used to, to keep things current, right? And modern. Mm -hmm. I love both sides of it. And I also love to come to that root cause. Why is that technology coming? Is it just something new and modern to keep us, you know, new and modern or is it solving a problem? And getting to that at the very beginning is, is great because I always like to start with a benefit statement. Here are the benefits of what we're doing. And the overarching theme of the benefits is either going to be it's new and modern or it's solving this problem that you presented. And so coming to the root cause of the technology, that's probably my favorite, favorite part. Yeah. Are there any downsides, things that you don't like about working so close with technology all the time? Yes, <laughs> I would say not always being able to impact where the technology is going because of the role that I play, right? Okay, sometimes the technologies can be a little more important <laughs> than what kind of changes the people are going to have to make. Um, Technology is, is very important in a lot of companies, and we, we all know that. So it's sometimes being the advocate for the people and saying, hey, sometimes we're going to have to tweak this technology in this way for them. And not everybody wants to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Or sometimes we just don't need to do this. Um, and like I said, back to the root cause, if it's just to be modern, awesome. If it's to solve a problem, maybe there's a different way to solve it that doesn't even involve technology. Maybe it's a conversation <laughs> and that can be a hard conversation to have. Yeah. You're reminding me of a few conversations that I've heard from other podcast guests where they also talk about that sometimes we're trying to implement technology from a few different angles at the same time mm -hmm. that all affect the, the frontline workers. So there may be multiple initiatives that involve technology all at the same time. Yes. And somebody in your role has to advocate for the men and women on the front lines to say, Hey guys, hold on a second. I'm sure each one of those projects has merit on its own, but to go drive this amount of change and disruption into the front lines. And Oh, by the way, we very literally in your case need to keep the trains, you know, rolling. Um, you know, it's just not acceptable. We've got to flip this around and say, you know, how would we feel if we were being impacted by all this change at the same time and still had our full job to do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes there's a, there's a plus to doing something fast. I'm sure in a lot of professions um, for the railroad, especially too, you, there's a schedule. And so doing things quickly matters very much. And sometimes technology can slow things down. Yeah. And so it's just identifying, hey, how, how much of an impact and in which areas is this technology going to impact things um, for, for the people and for the processes that they're, they're doing. 
Yeah. You just said another great point, which is that sometimes in the short term, the tech actually slows things down. And, you know, I've seen that even in successful projects where in the long term, things do settle down and those efficiencies are gained. But the short term has an impact to the business and even to the, you know, just to the use of that technology. And so there's a, a little bit of a price to pay. And all of us that are involved in, in helping to smooth out those bumps a little bit just need to acknowledge that there might be a bit of a slowdown. And, and we all need to look for ways to limit the slowdown, limit the valley, uh, and make sure that we can, you know, keep the business running as effectively as possible while that change is being implemented. Absolutely. And a lot of times what I love, what I've seen is that the the technology can connect so many different frontline workers. I mean, if you've got all of these employees doing a different job uh, with the same end goal, but they're all doing it in a silo, that technology kind of, you know, gets them all to be able to talk to each other, at least the work that they're doing talks to each other. And so just kind of, kind of thinking about that, that impact across the entire job or to the end, how is this time if it's slower or faster going to affect maybe this role down the line and their timing of how they're doing things, either better or worse, or just kind of really mapping that out. So that's yeah. a fun part of it too. Yeah. Just playing the t- to the end. <laughs> well, it sounds like you have found yourself in the perfect role at the perfect organization for you. So uh, congratulations for that. And i um, very excited to, uh, to stay in touch with you and uh, see how things continue to, uh, to evolve in your team. Absolutely. It's been fun. Well, good. And that, that actually uh, brings me to the next point. So you have uh, earned a pass now to uh, come and join us in a private group that we have on LinkedIn called the Frontline Innovators Council. The only fee for entry is sitting through the 45-minute podcast with me or with Gene. And, uh, and so you have uh, earned your entry in. So uh, after we stop recording today, you'll get an invitation to uh, come and participate in that group. We're up to about 30 members as of today, and it's all of the previous guests of the Frontline Innovators podcast. And so uh, we really just want to make sure that this conversation doesn't end after today, that we're able to uh, continue to stay in touch with you and introduce you to uh, all of the other fellow guests and and keep the conversation going. So we have a lot of change management practitioners and and leaders in that group. We also have some folks that come from more of the uh, technology side. We also have some folks that I would say really come from more the the vendor side that are providing technology solutions to companies like yours. So it's a good group, and uh, we're going to continue to expand that throughout 2022, and uh, we welcome you to it. Thank you. Has it been 45 minutes already? It has. It's crazy. Time flies. It it really is uh, crazy how fast these conversations go. I think we're going to have to start to set up like, you know, uh, podcast A and B so that we can have some, some longer conversations, but uh, yeah. So thank you, Sydney. Thank you so much. It's been a a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed uh, getting to know you a little bit, hearing a little bit more about your organization and appreciate you sharing some of the best practices and lessons learned. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Justin. Excellent. Well, we do need to wrap it up there. And uh, for the audience, I know you found this conversation enjoyable um, because Sydney had a lot of great things to share. So um, thank you for listening and and please share and rate the podcast. Five-star ratings help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. And don't forget, this podcast is sponsored by Skillful, the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. Visit the website at skillful.com. That's S-K-Y-L-L-F-U-L.com. And if you or somebody else that you know is out there innovating on the front lines, we'd really love to hear about it and consider having them uh, or you as a guest on the show. So please reach out to me and uh, on LinkedIn. If it's you, tell me your story. If it's somebody else, make an introduction. But either way, we'd love to have uh, some additional guests on the show and would love for them to uh, come referred to us by one of our listeners. So thank you very much for listening. And Sydney, thanks again for your time today. 